start um, a series this uh, this evening um, from the book of Philippians. Oh, good. And uh, I haven't looked at Philippians in quite a while, so um, let us begin with a word of prayer, and uh, then we'll uh, get into uh, this evening's message. Also, the next rummet sale is March 4th, 5th, and 6th, and there's some flyers in the back of the church for that. So, so that's that. Well, anyways, let us begin with a word of prayer. Gracious Father, we thank you. We thank you for this word. We thank you for this book that the Apostle Paul uh, so graciously wrote to the church at Philippi. We'll understand it more as we open this book, but Father, I pray that you would give each of us wisdom and understanding. Father, if we lack wisdom, your brother, Jesus' brother James said, if anyone lacks wisdom, he's to ask of God, Amen. and God will give him wisdom abundantly and liberally. So we pray that we would have abundant wisdom even now, Lord, yes, as we begin studying this book of Philippians. Bless us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So, the book of Philippians. Um, the first uh, message that I want to preach in this particular series on Philippians is going to be called Joyful Living in a Grumpy World. Nice. And um, a lot of people are just grumpy, and um, the world just makes them grumpy, but you can have joyful living in a grumpy world, and we'll talk about that today. We're going to look at the first eight verses of Philippians chapter 1 today. And um, I think probably by most accounts that this beloved book in the, the New Testament would probably be, um, be one of the most beloved books. Um, people like to read Philippians, and people like to study Philippians, people like to memorize Philippians, those of you who are the better Bible students. But um, there's a reason why people like the book of Philippians, not the least of which, it's probably the happiest letter the Apostle Paul ever wrote. And um, a lot of his other letters deal with issues, like we've been going through Romans, deal with doctrinal issues. But this is probably the happiest letter that Paul ever wrote. You know, they say that Disneyland's the happiest place in the world, but this book is the happiest letter in the world. And... Um, it, uh, it's clear that sometimes Paul was not lighthearted when he wrote. He wasn't in a lighthearted mood, and um, some of his letters, especially when it comes to correct serious errors in the church, mm. those are heavier books. Um, examples of that would be Galatians comes to mind, Colossians comes to mind, and perhaps even Second Thessalonians comes to mind. But Paul's mood was obviously... Um, geared to the upside when he wrote this brief letter. Just four chapters long, and I'm kind of excited to be preaching through Philippians for three reasons. Firstly, um, the letter's short, but it, come, it covers almost every Christian doctrine that um, we probably need to address. And um, so as we work through these four chapters in the next few weeks, um, you'll be introduced to many of the great doctrines of the Christian faith, including the person and the work of Jesus Christ, the um, justification by faith, the second coming of Christ, and many other aspects of sanctification. Sanctification is an important work of the Holy Spirit that all Christians should undertake and should be undertaking. Uh, it, it's a work of God, but... It needs your cooperation. Mm -hmm. um, secondly, this book also shows us the relational side of Christian faith. Um, here we learn that Paul, he dealt with many of his opponents, opponents that were in the church and outside of the church, and we'll discover how to deal with those people that are cantankerous, you know, those people that just have um, the wrong spirit cantankerous Christians and the importance of unity in the body of Christ. That's a key element of, of God's work, that there should be unity amongst the brethren. The third thing is a study of Philippians teaches us how to find joy in the midst of personal pain and pressure and problems. And this is perhaps the place where 
life and truth touches life at its rawest point. Um, all of us, um, you know, we go through pain and pressure and problems, and a lot of times we ask God, you know, uh, what's going on and what's God trying to say to me? And I think when we ask God that question, what are you trying to say to me? Um, it's a sobering question, you know. You know, why would God allow this or why would God cause this? And this is truly a mystery. It's a mystery both on a personal level and a theological level. And unfortunately, we live in a world where pain, problems, and tragedies, you know, almost are commonplace. You know, and I don't think that Philippians offers us all the final answers to the mystery of suffering. But there, there is some light here in Philippians that point us to a way that genuine Christians should have a joyful response. And that seems kind of weird for a lot of us. It's like, you know, if I'm a genuine Christian, what should be my response to suffering and pain and problems? But as we read these four chapters, Paul will tell us in many different ways that why, while we can't control what happens to us, we have total control regarding how we respond. Amen. A lot of times when life throws stuff at us, we don't respond well. When tragedy strikes, when children die, when planes crash, when good men and women go to jail, when people gossip, when marriages break up, when people lie to cover their behavior, and a whole sort of other, all kinds of sorted other problems. You know, there's nothing that we can sometimes do about all of this because a lot of this is the ongoing consequence of living in a fallen world. We live in a world where evil rules or seems to, but then we have a great big God. But the thing is this, we have a choice regarding how we respond to the hurts and the heartaches and the pain and the pressures and the problems of life. Everybody has to deal with them. Sometimes we can't avoid them, and sometimes other people's free will encroaches upon our lives. Amen. But how we respond makes all the difference. And that's the primary contribution of this wonderful little book that has blessed the people of God for more than 2,000 years. How to respond in a godly way, in a genuine Christian way, when life throws the kitchen sink at us, and sometimes even more. But before we jump into this book, I want to give us a bit of background on this book because I think it's important at the start of this book to understand the context of this book. And before we jump into this book, I think the background should be given at the front end. I want you to keep in mind two dates in terms of this book. The first date is A.D. 51, after the death of Christ, 51. And the second date is A.D. 61. They're both critical. The first date is the approximate year when the Apostle Paul made his first trip to Philippi. And how do we know this? We know this because it's recorded in Acts chapter 16. Paul went to Philippi, and we know the year from that particular point, in that particular writing, a different book in the New Testament. And here he meets Lydia, the seller of purple, by the riverside, she was a successful woman, an industrious woman, and he leads her to faith in Christ. Then Paul casts out a demon out of a young girl, and for this act of kindness, casting out of a demon, Paul is thrown into jail for doing a good deed. And there Paul leads the jailer to Christ. It's pretty amazing. Then he baptizes the jailer, and then he converts the whole family and deals with them in the middle of the night because he couldn't do it in day. And then soon after that, Paul leaves Philippi and he travels on to Berea, Thessalonica, and Athens. And from the inauspicious beginning of this great church, this was the beginning and at the point when this church was born, A.D. 51. And since Paul founded the church, and since he had personally led the 
the, the, the key charter members to Christ in this church, they naturally looked to him with great reverence and, and love and respect. And in turn, Paul kept this particular church always near and dear to his heart. There was kind of a bond formed between the Apostle Paul and the people at Philippi that would never be broken no matter what happened. And then 10 years later, Paul found himself in prison again in Rome, awaiting trial before Caesar. So that's the AD 61 date. And he was under some type of house arrest, which meant that he was being watched by the Praetorian Guard. The Praetorian Guard was an elite group of Roman soldiers. And when you were being watched by the uh, Praetorian Guard, you were chained to a guard at all times, physically chained to a guard. And he wasn't really in solitary confinement, but he could receive visitors in, in prison, and he could even preach while he was in prison. They didn't stop him from pe preaching. And he could teach other people about Christ while he was in prison, Praise and he God. did just that. And when the Philippian church had heard about his imprisonment in Rome, they decided we have to do something. So they sent a much-loved leader named Epaphroditus to Rome, and they brought a monetary gift for Paul to meet his personal needs because he didn't have any money on him. It's kind of like putting money in somebody's commissary account when they're in jail. You know, they can buy things that they need that aren't provided for by the government. So while in Rome... Epaphroditus became sick and so ill that he nearly died for the good deed that he did in bringing a monetary gift to the Apostle Paul. And when word got back to the, uh, the Philippians, they were concerned. They were concerned about Paul. He was in prison facing uh, his possible death. And then their emissary, Epaphroditus, that they sent, he's almost dead. And then Eventually, Epaphroditus returned to health, and Paul sent him back to Philippi carrying a brief thank you note. This brief thank you note is the letter that Paul wrote to the Philippian church. Nice. This brief note is a part of the New Testament book of Philippians. The, the, the tone of this note or letter, it's spontaneous. It's very warm and it's very personal. And Paul uses the word joy and rejoice 14 times in 104 verses. It's kind of strange that a guy that would find himself in jail facing death would think about joy and rejoicing when his life was literally on the line. You could say he was on death row. One commentator said that this is the most intimate diary written by the great apostle of the Christian faith, the Apostle Paul. And here we kind of get a glimpse into Paul's heart. The heart of this letter begins really in verse 3 of chapter 1 with Paul giving thanksgiving for the Philippians. This paragraph, which runs through verse 8, gives us a glimpse into Paul's heart and shows us why Paul loved this church so much. It starts out in verse 3 this way. It says, I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. You see the importance of that AD 51 and um, AD 61. I mean, 10 years later, they still have this fondness and Christian love one for another. And Paul begins by expressing his gratitude for all that the Philippian believers meant to him. He remembered his friends, and his memory led him to give thanks, not to them, but to God. And his thanksgiving led naturally to this joyful prayer on their behalf. And Paul chose to focus on the positive. He was, like I said, he was locked up, he was in prison, but Paul didn't say that. He, 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 he wrote this letter on a positive note. I wonder 
how many of you could say the same thing about your own prayers? Mm -hmm. They're all positive. Or do we kind of shake our finger at God and tell him, why am I in this fix, even if this fix was of our own making? Oh, or God, where are you? Because even though I did this to myself, you're supposed to just magically make me get out of this difficult pain, pressure, problem that I often cause of my own doing. See, often when we pray, our prayers are on the negatives. You know, we pray that God would correct something in somebody else. You know, Lord, that boss that I have, he's just a complete jerk. Could you fix him? Hmm. You know, we, we ask God to change something so that it's more to our liking. Hmm. You know, hmm. you know, I know I got help, Lord, but not helped enough. Hmm. You know, and I wish that church, they'd give out more of this or more of that or do more for me. I mean, you know, one lady just posted last week on Facebook. You know, that church, they don't like certain people. They didn't like me. And um, she said they had the nerve to ask me for my, um, to identify myself and provide information about who I am. Well, that's not us. You know, the people that give us food have asked us to do that. So we're just following the directions of Amen. the people that blessed us. Thank and, you, um, you know, if we want to continue to have food to give away, I mean, we're required to report you know who's getting the food so that they know it's going to somebody that's in need Amen. but you know it's funny how we pray we want god to fix our problems fix our pain fix our pressures we want god to change other people and we oftentimes overlook the fact that we need the changing most Amen. you know we sometimes think that god has to correct things because the things that we did are wrong which led us to the current predicament we're in, but God should just magically fix that. I was reading a commentary by Pastor Steve Mays, and he offered some helpful advice about the importance of keeping a positive focus when we pray. He said this, Whenever you pray for someone, begin by thanking God for them. Thank God for the role that they've played in your life, for all that they've done for you, for the things that they've done for other people. Even if you're having a conflict with this person, Amen. thank God that he or she is giving you the opportunity to grow spiritually, to learn forgiveness, to be more patient, and on and on and on. If you try, you can always find something to be thankful for Amen. in just about anyone. Amen. It says, Pastor May goes on to mention the famous 80-20 rule. Um, we knew this 80-20 rule, or I knew this 80-20 rule from business, but... It applies to church as well. And Pastor May says in any church, 80% of the people do 20%. 80% of the people do 20% of the work, while 20% of the people do 80% of the work. Amen. You know, and it's said that this, this rule holds true in almost every realm of life. 80% of your business comes from 20% of your customers. And he commented that he once pastored a church and he said that this 80-20 rule in particular was troublesome to him. Because he said when the church became divided, 80% of the people wanted him fired and 20% of the church wanted him killed. You know, he said he found it difficult to pray for all the opposition within his church when the church was imploding. And he said there was one man in particular who continually openly opposed him and open, openly spoke against him at every opportunity. And the pastor determined that he would never pray for this man without first giving thanks for him. He said as difficult as it was, he eventually found that the Lord was bringing many things to his own mind, including the man's extreme faithfulness to the church, this man's eagerness and willingness to serve the church, this man's generous heart towards the church, this man's love for his family and his children and his grandchildren. And eventually the pastor found... His own heart was being changed as he prayed for this cantankerous Amen. man. Then he said the day came when he and the man found themselves in the car together. And the man opened his heart and he began sharing about his wife. He began sharing about his work and he even ended up complimenting the pastor on his sermon that day. What had happened? He said, thankful prayer makes a difference. And he said, anyone can pray against another person, Amen. but only God can give you the grace 
to pray for a person instead. See, a lot of times, that's the way our prayers work. And when asked how he dealt with all of his enemies, even Abraham Lincoln replied, if at all possible, I turned them into my friends. Nice. You know, this is a radical transformation. And this radical transformation is only possible if we pray with thanksgiving for those who oppose us as Paul did. Actually, another pastor wrote these words. He once advised praying for his enemies this way. Lord, bless this person who bless this person whom I foolishly regard as my enemy. Keep them in thy favor. Banish my own resentment. Amen. You know, how different would the world be if we banished the resentment that we hold in our hearts? If we offered people genuine love, Christian love, kindness, and so on. What a different world this could be. Amen. You know, and I'm sure we probably don't think about it often, but eternity will ultimately reveal how this all plays out. The second point that I want to make is found in verse 6. The Apostle Paul says, Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you Amen. will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Amen. This particular verse is really near and dear to me. One of my first serious spiritual fathers, Pastor James Lee Beal from Bethesda, he wrote this verse in a Bible that he gave to me probably 35, 40 years ago. Nice. And this verse is very important to me. Many people consider this particular verse one of the greatest verses in the entire Bible. He who began a good work in you will carry it out to completion. What a comfort that is to know that God will complete what he starts. Amen. Theologians use it to defend the doctrine of perseverance of the saints. And I don't particularly like that particular phrase, the perseverance of the saints, because it puts the emphasis in the wrong place. I would prefer to say that I believe in the perseverance of God. Because I know how God has had to put up with me. Amen. And so knowing that... Jesus. I look at you guys and think it's the perseverance of God, not the perseverance of the saints. Because the perseverance of the saints puts the onus on us. See, Philippians 1 6 teaches us that we'll be reserved to the end. And we'll be preserved to the end because God will always persevere. See, some of us, we don't persevere like God perseveres. God always perseveres. Amen. Amen. See, a lot of times, we like to throw it down and quit and start over, and we have fits and starts, and, you know, even with other people. But that's not how God is. He doesn't have fits and starts. God is just on a smooth level, always willing to persevere with each of us. See, we have to get to the point when we truly understand this. What God starts, He always finishes. Amen. And I know that's not true of all of you guys, because I know it's not true of me. You know, but what God starts, he always finishes. But I think we need to note three things from this particular verse. The first thing is this. God takes the initiative in starting his work in you. See, God takes the initiative. He's the one who begins the good work in us. Salvation exclusively and always begins with God. See, God makes the first move, and if he didn't make the first move, we would make no move at all. Amen. Perhaps you've heard about the country preacher who was being examined for his ordination to the ministry. Well, he was before this board, and they asked him how he had become, you know, a Christian. And the preacher, soon to be ordained, said, I did my part, and God did his part. And that sounded questionable to this board. So the learned brethren on this council asked the preacher, explain his part in salvation. So the pastor went on, he said, my part was to run from God as fast as I could. God's part was to run after me and catch me and bring me into the family of God. Amen. And I think that's a biblical answer because all of us were born running away from God. And unless God took the initiative to find us, we would still be running away Thank from you, God. Jesus. Hallelujah. 
The second point that I want to make on this particular verse, Philippians 1, 6, is this. God takes personal responsibility in completing his work in you. Amen. I find this one of the most comforting thoughts. See, God has a good work because it says, he who began a good work. Amen. See, God has a good work that he intends to use in your life and use in my life. Mm -hmm. See, nothing will block the accomplishment of God's divine purpose. You can run for a while and you can be stupid for a while. You can do <laughs> crazy for a while. But God will always accomplish in your life what he wants to accomplish. Amen. See, God intends that all of his children be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. You, God. And God will not rest until that good work is finally accomplished and finished. Mm -hmm. Perhaps you've seen those buttons a few years back. I think I mentioned this one time before and people were like, huh? You know, those buttons that had those funny letters on them. P-B-B-G-I-F-W-M-Y. And it's like, huh? You know, these cryptic letters stand for this important theological truth. Please be patient. God isn't finished with me yet. Amen. That's what P-B-B-G-F-Y-W-M-Y stands for. Be patient. Please be patient. God isn't finished with me or you. Amen. See, thank God it's true. Yeah. You know, some of us might not look like much, but you have to understand, God isn't finished with you. Amen. And God isn't finished with me. Be careful when you want to look down your nose on somebody. Amen. You know, because I might not look, I mean, Portia, who, who's been helping out at the church, you know, they were asking everybody's age, and she was about 20 or 30 years low for everybody. And then she looked at me and said, you're 86. And I thought, wow, I might only be your pastor for another month or two, you know, if I'm 86. You know, this is getting kind of scary, but no, no offense taken. But I mean, this is getting serious if I look 86 to somebody, you know, but be patient with me, too, because God isn't finished with me yet. Amen. And, um, you know, like I said, you know, when you look in the mirror and you look even deeper into your own soul, you may not like what you see. It doesn't really matter because God isn't finished with you yet. See, so you have to be careful even how you look at your own image and how you look at your own soul. And here's the good news and the bad news in this truth. The good news is that since God isn't finished yet, we have hope for the future. The bad news is since God isn't finished yet, he won't let us stay as we are Amen. today. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. See, God's not just going to sit back and say, eh, do whatever you want and you know, I'll <laughs> talk to you in about 10 years. You know, God's not satisfied to just let us stay as we are. He wants us, <clears throat> excuse me, to, to be in the image of his son mm -hmm. and he'll push us in that direction. Mm -hmm. so he's going to keep chipping away you know, I say God has sandpaper because I know he's used it on me. Yeah. You know, he's going to chip away and sand away until we're conformed into the image of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. But the other bad news is this. Most of us have a long way to go. <laughs> Some of us have an enormous distance to travel, but that doesn't even matter to God. Amen. See, I'd rather be six inches from hell heading towards heaven, then, then be six inches from heaven, heading towards hell. Amen. See, direction makes all the difference. And where are you pointed to, toward? You know, it, it makes the direction is extremely important. And if you find yourself in muck and mire of personal defeat, you know, as you read these words, you have to be encouraged See, child of God, God's not finished with you yet. Thank you have to rise and walk in the ways of God. Thank you, Jesus. God's not finished with you ever. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes, you know, we get the idea, God must have gave up on me. No, he didn't. That's mm -hmm. your own silly brain. Amen. You know, that's not the mind of God. You know, and, you know, if, if you've been sent to the bench for a personal foul, if you want to use some football terms, 
you know, learn the lesson that God has for you. Mm, and then get God. back in the game. Amen. You know, you might be on the sidelines for a minute, but you know what? Get off your butt and get back in the game. Amen. See, God's not finished with you yet. Don't give up on yourself. Right. That's right. And the third thing, and this is really critically important, God guarantees the outcome of his work in you. Amen. He doesn't just suggest the outcome. God guarantees the outcome. Not only did wow. God start the process, not only did God continue the process, God guarantees the ultimate outcome for all of us who are believers. See, it says in this text that he will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Amen. This means that God won't be turned aside by difficulties of any, any, any kind. God won't be turned away because you made poor choices. God won't be turned away because you did some dumb stuff along the way. Amen. See, God is determined to make you like Jesus. Amen. That even your own backsliding won't ultimately hinder and accomplish God's purpose for you. You know, you might slide for a while. You might, you know, fall over. You might do all kinds of dumb stuff. But someday, somehow, you and I will stand before Jesus Christ as redeemed children of God, holy, blameless, and complete in every way. Mm. You know, we're all far sight from that right now today, mm. but a better day is coming for the people of God. See, what is incomplete, God will make complete. Amen. What's unfinished, God will make finished. Amen. What's lacking, God will make full and overflowing. Amen. What is partial, God will make whole. You know, what is less than enough from our perspective today will be far more than adequate at some point in time. Thank you, Jesus. See, what is broken today, God will fix. Amen. Right. What is hurt today, God will heal. Amen. What is weak today, God will make strong. Amen. What is temporary today, God will make permanent. See, God has promised to do it. Mm -hmm. And one thing we know from the text is God does not lie. We might tell little white lies and big whopper lies, but God never lies. Amen. And if God made a promise to do it, God will do it. What God has begun, and when God has begun a good work in you, God will finish that good work. Amen. So this, this, this evening, if you feel incomplete, this evening, if you feel unfinished, don't fear. God will complete his work in you. This is so important. I mean, it's it's kind of funny. You know, now they have these new t-shirts that say fear over faith. But, you know, when I was a young Christian, they used to have these big letters, no fear, you know, on t-shirts. You know, you don't have to have fear because in Christ, you can have confidence. Amen. And if you're in Christ, if you're in Jesus, there's no fear as you face whatever comes your way. The third point in the last couple of verses that I want to look at this evening are verses 7 and 8. The text reads as follows. It is right for me to feel this way about all of you, since I have you in my heart, for whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. Amen. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of of Christ Jesus. Wow. Amen. I mean, do you see the power in these words? I mean, take any of these words. Here, Paul is in chains. I mean, consider his physical position. Most of us would be, well, there's a lot of words we could use, but I can't say I'm here. But most of us would be pretty upset if we were chained to a guard, chained and locked in prison. We would just be pretty, we would just be pretty upset. But Paul explains his affection in three different ways. First, his personal commitment. He says, I have you in my heart. The second point that he shares is shared ministry. He says, all of you share in God's grace with me. And then he gives a divine testimony. God can testify how I long for all of you. You know, as I was pondering these verses, and, and preparing the, the, these words, the thought hits me that the world can counterfeit all of this. 
See, that's what the world tries to do. They try to counterfeit it, but they can't duplicate it. Mm. It's funny, I was reading something about the Secret Service a few years back. And you know what? They never show a Secret Service agent counterfeit bills. No, that's right. They only show Secret Service agents the genuine bills and then tell them, study that bill so well that you can detect a counterfeit. Amen. They never show them what the counterfeits look like. They only tell them, study the real deal. Amen. And that's how the Secret Service finds counterfeit bills. Well, now they have technology as well, but um, that's what how they train Secret Service agents. And the world tries to counterfeit all of this. That's why people go to bars, hoping to have fun, hoping to meet that someone special. It's why people join clubs and social organizations. And it's why people get involved with community improvement groups. You know, it's why people go on the internet into chat rooms because they're lonely and they want to talk to people. See, men and women desperately want deep relationship, but most people don't have a clue where to find it. Thank you, brother. See, the affection that Paul had for the Philippians and the affection that they had for him, this comes only through a shared relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen. Only God can fill that emptiness all of us try to fill with so many different things. And those who know Jesus were joined in a spiritual bond that runs deeper than any human tie, even biological ties. <clears throat> After all, if you make it to heaven, I have to spend eternity with you. So, I mean, Thank we might also Jesus. start getting along now. Right. Amen. Amen. Right. <laughs> That's just a side note. That's a whole other sermon series. <laughs> Lord Jesus, help me. Oh, yeah. Okay. The new, new, new seeds for another series. But the third point that I want to uh, make today is there's an invitation here for real, true joy. There's only two questions that remain. The first question is this. How could Paul feel so joyful, so positive, and so optimistic? One thing we knew for sure, it wasn't because of his circumstances. Oh. See, most of us, everything's based on our feelings, and feelings often betray us. And if we just looked at our circumstances, we'd say, mm, I have the right to be miserable. <laughs> I have the right to be Miss, Mr. or Mrs. Grumpy, you know? And uh, the message is how to be joyful in a grumpy world. I mean, you know, some people think, you know, uh, if, you, if you had my life to live, you'd be Mr. Grumpy or Miss, Miss Grumpy too. But think about this. Paul wasn't joyful, positive, and optimistic because of his circumstances. Paul was in prison. Paul was in chains. Paul was on trial for his life. Paul was physically weak. Paul was under attack by fellow Christians who distrusted him. And Paul was behind bars, so he didn't have the freedom to move around. Surely... Anybody with these circumstances would have every reason to be angry. Mm. Paul had every reason to be mean and miserable. Yet, Paul speaks of joy. Paul speaks of thanksgiving. Paul th speaks of gratitude. Paul speaks of confidence. Paul speaks of deep affection that he left for the Philippian Christians. Mm. Although his circumstances were terrible, Far from ideal, Paul refused to let his circumstances dictate his emotions. See, most of us, we just let our emotions carry us off, carry us away. But Paul, by God's grace, chose to rise <clears throat> above his circumstances. Yes, Lord. <clears throat> it makes us so much better and stronger as Christians if we can learn by God's grace and Amen. choose by God's grace to rise above the circle. There's always going to be something that can tick you off. Amen. There's always something that can make you crazy. Amen. You know, but don't let, don't let those circumstances, the pain and the pressure and the problems, you know, dictate your thinking. Amen. And this leads to a second question that comes to mind as I purview and read these verses. What's harder? To be in prison or not be in prison. Mm. You see, 
for 10 years of my previous life, I went to prison every single week. Mm. I went to the Mound Road Correctional Facility at Davis and a Mound in the center of Detroit, mm -hmm. and I ministered to inmates. I had a Bible study for inmates for 10 straight years, never missed a week. I would fly in if I was on business and shortcut whatever I was doing personally or business-wise to be there because this Bible study meant so much to me. Mm -hmm. Praise God. And I can tell you that some of the people that were in prison had more freedom than the people that were walking the streets. Amen. Amen. Because they had Christ. So most of us would probably say, of course it would be harder to be in prison and easier to be out. That's the quick answer, but it's not the right answer. Amen. The correct answer is this, it depends. See, in that situation, I knew people who were behind bars, but they were truly free because they discovered the life-changing power Amen. of a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And I know other people who walk the streets and think they're free, mm -hmm. but they aren't in jail, but they're chained by chains of bitterness. Amen. They're chained by chains of anger. They're chained by chains of lust. They're chained by chains of despair. They're chained by chains of greed and a host of other sins that enslave us Amen. on the inside. Amen. And that leads me to a statement that might serve as a theme for this whole series from Philippians. Joy does not depend on the circumstances. Joy de is dependent on a living relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Because until Jesus Christ is the centerpiece of your life, mm -hmm. you won't be happy. Amen. And even more important than that, <clears throat> you won't find true joy. Because true joy and true rejoicing only comes when you're in Christ and you have a living, real, genuine relationship with Jesus. Mm -hmm. So you might be thinking, oh, wait a minute, what are you trying to tell me? Mm. What I'm saying is this. If you don't have the joy that you feel that you're entitled to right now, mm -hmm. don't blame your circumstances. Amen. All right. Amen. They were never meant to bring joy in the first place. Mm. Circumstances don't bring joy. That's right. Amen. If you build your life on circumstances, you're going to be miserable. Amen. More often than not. See, you need a source of joy that does not change. Mm, thank you, Father. This is an eternal perspective that comes only from knowing Jesus Christ. Amen. Many years ago, I learned this little acrostic on the word joy. I haven't thought about it in a long time, but I began to think about it as I was thinking about this message. And here is God's prescription for joy. The J in joy means Jesus first. Mm -hmm. The O in joy means others second. And the Y in joy means yourself third. Mm -hmm. See, in this statement, it's simple and it's true. <clears throat> when Jesus is first in your life, you can have joy that goes beyond your circumstances. Amen. You can have joy that is beyond your ability to have understanding of how it even happens. Mm -hmm. See, if you truly know Jesus and you're truly in Christ, you've discovered the central reality of the universe. Build your life on Jesus Christ and you'll never, and I mean never, ever, be disappointed. Amen. Amen. But you have to put your life in Christ. Amen. And that's why Paul mentions it over and over again in his, in his writings and his epistles. You know, in Christ, with Christ, by Christ, through Christ. Mm -hmm. I mean, in every possible dimension, find yourself in Christ. Mm -hmm. Let us bow our heads and pray. Gracious Father, Father, I thank you. I thank you for all that you're doing in each of our lives. Even when we don't see it, Lord, even when we don't fully understand it, Lord, Father, your spirit indwells us and you're working on our behalf. Father, I pray that we could discover the joy that comes from a living relationship with your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Father, I just pray that we find ourselves in that place. That we stop letting circumstances and emotions dictate everything in our lives. When pain and pressure and problems come, why they slam us down, Lord. When you're there, ready to help us, ready to pull us up, ready to remove us from the muck and mire. But sometimes we just like to wallow in that muck and mire. So, Father, I just pray that you give us a different perspective as we study this book of Philippians, that we can count it all joy. Help us to be patient, Lord, as you complete the unfinished work of making each of us like your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Sometimes that's painful. Sometimes it takes longer than we think it should. That chipping away and that sanding down all those little rough spots and chiseling those parts that we know don't belong in our life. Father, allow this work in each of us. Allow us to be absolutely committed to being in your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Allow the Spirit that's within us to do that critical work of sanctification. I pray this all in Jesus' name. And all the saints said, Amen. 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 Thank you.